Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on with Iran and Israel. I don't think the general population understands what happened, what Israel did a couple weeks ago to really kind of take this to the next level. If you know that Julian Assange has been in the embassy before he got sent to Belmarsh for many years, right there in England, and yet the, the British didn't go in there and grab him, the Brits, right? They let him be. Why? Because consulates, embassies are considered a red line. You don't mess with, the, with an embassy. They're considered the actual country of that particular embassy. So if a Moscow embassy in, in New York is there and they attack or raid the Moscow embassy, they're raiding Russia. And that's a very over-the-line type of thing. Well, Israel did just that. They bombed an Iranian embassy in Damascus just two weeks ago. It went over a lot of people's heads. A lot of people didn't even know about it. A lot of people didn't think about it. But with us here today is our good friend Caleb Maupin, to discuss a little bit more about that attack, and then I ran retaliating because it had no choice. Ladies and gentlemen, from RT and CPI, Center for Political Innovation, Caleb Maupin is here. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you, brother. How about you? Oh, it's all good. It's starting to feel like summertime a little bit here in New York City, uh, so that's good. It took long enough. It's been raining like crazy. And those brutal winters, brother. I don't know how you do it. I haven't done it in such a long time. I'm from New York. I'd rather just watch New York basketball and New York hockey from a distance here in South Florida where it's nice and sunny. Thank you. So, sure thing. Yeah. So, Caleb, let's start off with this right away. I mean, there's a couple of articles I have. I really don't want to dive too deep into them. But before we get into the first article, which is about Janet Yellen going up and whipping up other countries to get involved to sanction Iran, right? I mean, that's going to be their first move. You know, the United States is going to start you know, drawing a line in the sand saying you're either with us or you're against us, right? That was the George Bush quote. If you're with us, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists, is what he would say. But let's you're first talk about this. You're with the terrorists. The terrorists, right? Where's my Cheetos? <laughs> let's talk about the embassy first. A lot of people don't even know this, Caleb, that Israel bombed an Iranian embassy in Damascus, I believe killing two Iranian generals and several other soldiers. Can you give us a little insight to what happened and also the significance? Because people don't understand. That's a red line when you start bombing embassies. Go ahead, buddy. Well, it's not just this. I mean, Israel has been attacking Syria for years now because the Syrian government uh, has been trying to fight against Al-Qaeda. You know, there's a lot of radical extremist groups that have been trying to overthrow the Syrian government. So the Syrian government has asked Iran and Lebanese Hezbollah fighters to come into Syria and protect the country from extremists. And Iran is an ally of Syria. Hezbollah is an ally of Syria. That's the major political party and armed group in Lebanon. And they've been in Syria protecting the Syrian government with the Syrian government's permission. Well, Israel uh, has decided uh, that it has the right uh, to murder Iranians in Syria. And it's been doing this since at least 2014, 2015, I think possibly earlier. They've been shooting missiles into Syria. Uh, and they've killed a number of Iranian military people, a number of generals, a number of those people. And keep in mind, all of those forces are in Syria with the Syrian government's permission. Uh, the USA is occupying parts of Syria without the Syrian government's permission. Uh, and Donald Trump said we're there to seize the oil. And there's parts of Syria where there's U.S. troops on the ground. And the Syrian government that is part of the United Nations, it's part of the Arab League, uh, has not said that America has the right to be there. Also, the Golan Heights, which are Syrian territory, Israel seized it, uh, and they've seized hold of it. So we got big chunks of Syria that are seized by the United States and seized by Israel without the permission of the government. Iran has people in Syria that are protecting the government at the government's request. Uh, and so then in response to that, we have Israel just continuously violating Syria's territory, going into Syrian airspace, and bombing and killing Iranians. Well, they took it a little bit too far because in Damascus, which is the capital of Syria, Iran, just like every other country, it has it has a consulate, it has a diplomatic site. And Iran attacked that, uh, which is basic, or I'm sorry, Israel attacked that, that diplomatic site that belongs to Iran. Uh, it attacked that in Damascus and it killed seven Iranians, including top two generals, including a top military leader. And so Iran at that point said, all right, we've been dealing with this. You've been attacking our people for so long. You've been carrying out strikes and killing our people for so long. We have to respond. And they did what any country would do under these circumstances. You know, if, they, if, if somebody blew up an American embassy uh, and killed some top Pentagon general in the process, 
the United States would respond to that. Uh, I mean, Britain would do the same thing. Russia or China would do the same thing. This makes perfect sense. But because it's Iran, we're supposed to not think that Iran has the same rights as other countries, right? We're supposed to just fit with this narrative that Iran is a terrorist country. Iran is an extremist country. So, you know, so, so somehow, you know, they don't have the right to do what any other country would do under these circumstances. I gotta say, Iran's been holding off for years. For years, Iran has been holding off directly striking Israel. But, you know, their top general, Qasem Soleimani, got murdered. They gave up their peaceful nuclear energy program in exchange for supposedly, you know, lifting the sanctions, Obama lifting the sanctions. And then when Trump got in, he went back on everything that was promised and then murdered a top general. Uh, they've been having their people hit with missiles by Israel in, in, in Syria and in other parts of the world. And it's gotten to the point that uh, Iran said, look, we have to show that we're willing to retaliate. We have to maintain our credibility as a country. So they've responded. Israel hit a embassy that killed many, uh, several, uh, I'm sorry, thank you, that killed several soldiers, a couple generals, you mentioned this before. This is not the first time that something like this has happened. You just mentioned Soleimani too as well. Iran let the Israelis know like 48 hours in advance what they were doing and then bombed, uh, I believe, an Air Force base or something, right? Yeah. What do you see the two differences between the two uh, militaries, Iran and Israel, uh, because it seems like, you know, Israel and the United States don't care, you know, drone warfare, they'll kill as many civilians, humans as the, is whatever happens, right? What do they say? Casualty of war, right? 35,000 civilians just about in, in Gaza, not many Hamas militants. We don't see them, at least. We don't see dead Hamas militants. We don't see Hamas militants arrested. What are your thoughts between the two ways the, 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 the states, Iran versus Israel, wage war? Well, I got to say this. Um, you know, I have been hearing since I was politically aware about how poor little Israel is under threat from Iran and Iran is about to get Israel. It's going to get a nuclear bomb and nuke Israel. Oh, my God, we have to give Israel more weapons because Iran is going to get them. They're just so vulnerable and they're just under attack. And Iran is big and scary and is going to come get them. Well, now, finally. After all these years, I've been hearing this for years, since at least since 9-11, I've been hearing about how big, bad Iran is coming to get poor little Israel and Israel needs more of our money and all of this. So now we finally have a situation where after so much provocation, after so many attacks and so many assassinations, after a direct attack on the Iranian embassy, after so many of their people have been assassinated, where Iran finally turns around and attacks Israel, right? We, you know, they finally do it. And now the response of Israeli media and of mainstream media is, oh, it wasn't a big deal. It didn't bother Israel. No big deal. And I'm thinking, wait a second. For decades, we've been giving Israel so much weaponry and so much support because Iran was this big menace. And now when Iran finally does attack Israel, which they clearly didn't want to do, they held off doing it for years, year after year, provocation after provocation, they finally attack Israel. And then they're just like, oh, it was no big deal. Didn't matter. I want I want my money back, Pasta. I want my money back. I mean, this is ridiculous. They've been running a game on us. Look how quickly they changed the story, right? The big Iranian threat, the big Iranian menace. And now, oh, it's no big deal. Iran can attack us any day. We don't feel anything. Well, Israel's covering up how much damage was inflicted on them. They lost a huge Air Force base. Air Force bases are not cheap. In addition to that, uh, the American military was running around Jordan and Syria shooting down shooting down drones, and they, they spent over a billion dollars shooting down and deflecting uh, Iranian drones. And this all came when Iran gave a warning, we're going to do this, right? So, yeah. you know, I mean, it, I mean, if you if someone gives you a warning, they're going to attack and you still have to spend a billion dollars to stop them. And then on top of that, you lose a big Air Force base. It just gets completely demolished. I think at that point, you can say that Iran is a, a force to be reckoned with. And Iran has been saying, look, we, you ain't seen nothing yet. We, we used our oldest drones on you. We used some of our smallest missiles, but we got way bigger missiles. We got way faster drones. We can really make this happen. We had to demonstrate that we have force. That's the message that Iran has been giving. Look, we had to show that we can retaliate or else you're just going to keep provoking us. Uh, that that was the message. So, uh, you know, I think this makes perfect sense what Iran did. 
Israelis were fleeing from the uh, from the cities to the countryside, hiding in bomb shelters. An Air Force base got destroyed. A billion dollars was spent deflecting all the drones that were coming. Uh, you know, I think it's it's pretty clear that Iran, just like any other country, can defend itself, and they have been provoked. What I think is going on here is that Netanyahu very much wants a full-on regional war against Iran, right? It was very clear that Netanyahu is in big trouble in, in, in Israeli politics, uh, and there's a lot of people in Israel and in the United States who don't want him in power. And we're talking like pro-Israel people. We're not talking anti-Israel people. We're talking people within Israel that just think Netanyahu's a, a whack job and they want to get rid of him. And there's been, you know, protests and, you know, the Soros color revolution kind of stuff. So it looks like Netanyahu has figured the only way that he can stay in power is to keep the October 7th conflict going as long as he possibly can and try to then turn it into a fight against Iran, not just a fight, not just the ongoing bombardment of Gaza, which the whole world is condemning. So Netanyahu is really trying to save his political career here by escalating this. But I got to say this, when Iran attacked Israel, and that was the first time since, you know, since the bombardment of Gaza began, uh, the Palestinians had, had a moment of peace. That was the first time there weren't bombs falling on them. The Israeli military was focused on deflecting. Preoccupied, the yeah. Yeah, and so they gave the Palestinians a moment to breathe. Think about that, right? Um, you know, uh, and all over the Middle East, there's been people cheering for Iran, celebrating Iran, saying that Iran are heroes. You know, support for Iran is massive. Barack Obama was trying to divide the Muslim world between Sunnis and Shias between those who are loyal to Saudi Arabia and those who are loyal to Iran or those who might be loyal to Turkey and Qatar. And at this point, Iran is back in the good graces of the Muslim world because the whole world, the whole Muslim world hates Israel and what it's doing to the Palestinians. And Iran is fighting them. And the Houthis in Yemen are blocking ships and they're fighting them. And they're, you know, Shia and they're linked to Iran and Hezbollah is fighting them. And so a lot of Muslims who might have bought into the anti-Shia stuff that was coming from Saudi Arabia that Barack Obama was really promoting are now saying, look, Israel is clearly the main danger. And the people fighting Israel are aligned with Iran. So Iran is fine with me. The whole Obama strategy has completely fallen apart like a house of cards. The Muslim world is at this point united against Israel and against the United States, which is backing Israel. So uh, basically everything that the Obama administration was trying to do with the Arab Spring, with the Iran nuclear deal, it's all completely fallen to pieces like a house of cards. Well, let's talk a little bit about that for a second. We have an article here. We don't have to get into it, but we can just show the title really quick, Jamie. It's about Janet Yellen going around and she was sent. She's the messenger girl. You can put it on up, Jamie, real quick. She's the messenger girl to go out there and the U.S. will try to rally other uh, nations to sanction Iran over Israel's attack. So pretty much she's going to go out there and she's going to start whipping up, trying to whip up representatives from different countries to say, OK, you have to sanction Iran. Now, that makes me think, right? We heard a little and you can bring it on down, Jamie, and put us back to full screen. That makes me think right now for a second that, you know, I remember when the situation was taking place, supposedly Jordan free their airspace so the United States and Israel can shoot down some of these drones, right? And then I heard some ruckus that the fact that uh, that Iran told Jordan, you're going to have to make a choice here, dog. You're going to go, you're going to be loyal to the United States and what's going on over there, or you're going to start uniting with us in the Muslim world. Look what's going on with the Palestinians. No more of your soft little slanted, hey, be nice to the Palestinians. You're going to have to make a choice now. I see, I think the same thing with Saudi Arabia. Now we know Saudi Arabia and Iran have been coming closer together than ever before, right? They're, going, they're set to opening up embassies. I think there's going to be an embassy opening up in Riyadh, an Iranian uh, embassy over there. I think Iran is going to open up an embassy in, in Tehran. This is, uh, excuse me, Sa Saudi Arabia is going to open up an embassy in Tehran. So now the Saudis and the Iranians, which was once thought of as, as far as keeping them separated, coming together. So when I see this as Janet, Janet Yellen, I don't know why they would send her out there, you know. They sent her to China, and she showed Xi Jinping that she knows how to use chopsticks. I mean, this woman is mental over here. But when I hear this, I start to think, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, where are they going to stand on this? Qatar, we obviously know that they're going to swing one way. We know where the Houthis are. But what are your thoughts on when she's out there to whip up uh, some support for U.S. and Israel? Who is she targeting, and what do you think is going to happen with those particular countries? Well, Iran is already like one of the most sanctioned countries in the world, right? Iran is designated by the U.S. government as a state sponsor of terrorism. 
Uh, and Iran, you know, I mean, at this point, there's no swift transactions. There's, I mean, Iran is heavily sanctioned, but there's a whole section of the world that is happy to do business with them. Iran is part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization out of Beijing. Iran is very happy to negotiate and trade with, with Russia. Um, and Saudi Arabia, as you pointed out, you know, there was certainly tension there after the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, the Saudi government executed the top Shia cleric in Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Namir al Namir, and that was seen as kind of retaliation for the Iran nuclear deal. After that, the Iranian students went and uh, attacked the uh, Saudi embassy, and there was then no more diplomatic relations between the two countries. Um, but then, fast forward to when the special military operation in you know Ukraine started, uh, Biden went to the Saudis and said, "All right, you need to completely cut off." your relationship uh, with Russia. And the king of Saudi Arabia and the Saudis were like, well, we can't do that because we're a major oil producing country. And so is Russia. And Russia, uh, we need to be able to call them and consult with them about oil output because that oil price goes up and it goes down based on how much oil is, is put out every day, is refined. Uh, so they, you know, the king of Saudi Arabia, the crown prince needs to be able to call up the Russian president Putin and negotiate around the oil prices or else you're going to have chaos on the oil markets. So when Biden went to the Saudis and said, oh, you have to just completely cut off Russia, um, the Saudis were like, I'm sorry, we can't do that. Uh, we're just not going to do that. And that led to diplomatic distance uh, between the United States and Saudi Arabia. And at the same time, China, which trades with Saudi Arabia and with Iran, uh, they then started talks in China uh, between the Saudis and the Iranians, and they reached an agreement and they reestablished diplomatic relations. Um, and now there's a train that goes from Moscow in Russia to Tehran in Iran to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And now uh, because the United States made ridiculous demands on Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is getting along with Iran and with Russia and with China better than it ever has before. Um, and Biden went to Saudi Arabia and tried to like beg the Saudi crown prince to, you know, mess with the oil prices in a way that would help him. And he basically got, you know, got flipped the bird more or less. The Saudis didn't listen to him. Um, and this is a situation where the United States is the one that's end up ending up being isolated, not Iran, not Russia, not China. Uh, the United States is more and more becoming isolated. What's going on with the BRICS right now is very important because one of the requirements to join the BRICS is you can't have sanctions on any other BRICS country. So, you know, if 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 India, India is part of the BRICS, in order to be part of it, they can't have sanctions on Russia. They can't have sanctions on China, uh, you know, uh, and that that is opening all kinds of new doors. And, you know, in the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the USA did have the ability to just completely demolish countries. You know, Cuba, right? After the fall of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was their big trading partner. Soviet Union was gone. The USA put sanctions on Cuba and they wrecked the place. And there wasn't, they didn't have electricity all day. I mean, it was like they only had electricity for three or four hours a day and they, they didn't have gas to run their cars and they just wrecked Cuba. And Iraq, you know, there were, you know, there were hundreds of thousands of children in Iraq that died because the USA put sanctions on Iraq in the 90s. They couldn't get chlorine and stuff. North Korea, they, they fomented a food crisis in North Korea. That, that used to be what America could do. If you got on America's bad side, they could sanction you to death. That, you can't do that anymore. They can't do that anymore. And they've tried with Venezuela. They've tried with Iran. They've tried with North Korea. But now those countries can just trade with Russia. They can just trade with China. And many countries that used to play ball with the United States and help them sanction and just wipe these countries out economically have said, you know what, we're not going to do that. Saudi Arabia is not playing ball with the United States. And at this point, you know, Janet can go around and urge countries to further sanction Iran. Uh, but they know that if they want to have a good relationship with big economic powers like Russia, a major oil exporter, like China that produces half the world's steel and has the, the best phone manufacturer in the world, the biggest telecommunications manufacturer in the world, uh, they're going to have to uh, not sanction Iran. So she can say that, she can make noise, but it's not going to happen. Yep. Uh, Caleb, can you tilt your uh, your uh, camera down just a little bit? Because we want to put a couple banners down below. And I think Jamie doesn't want to cut your face off as right. we do that. So we want to keep that beautiful face there. OK, so where is Jordan going to stand on this whole situation? Jordan, the king, uh, king is the king Hussein still, I believe his name is. or He's like the sure. second, third heir to the king. 
Where are they going to stand with the situation? Because they did make a move and they allowed Israel to use their airspace, United States to use their airspace. Are they going to be loyal to the United States or do you think they're going to say no more and that's it? I mean, well, what are your thoughts on Jordan? Because that seems like the one, since they're so close and they're right in the middle, where does Jordan factor into the situation? Well, Jordan is a monarchy, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. And it's one of these countries, you know, let's back up a little bit. So after World War I, right, uh, there was a treaty that was discovered. It was a secret treaty and kind of, you know, WikiLeaks, you know, 1917 was when the Bolsheviks took over Russia. They leaked this secret treaty called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And that was that's where all the the map of the Middle East, that's where all the borders were drawn, Iraq you know, Syria, uh, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, that, that all those borders were drawn by the Americans, the British during World War I. And they won World War I, and then they imposed that map on the region. And what they did was they granted a lot of these countries independence, but they picked somebody they liked, like in Saudi Arabia, it was the House of Saud. In yeah. Jordan, it was the current royal family. And they put them in charge to be like puppets, right? They put, they put, these kind of monarchs in charge and the countries were formally independent and they put these monarchs in charge and these monarchs proceeded to export their oil to Britain and the United States. And in exchange for that, uh, they would then buy huge amounts of weapons from the United States. Um, and these, you know, these Arab, uh, you know, monarchies, uh, they were overthrown in the sixties. You had uprising Syria, you had patriotic officers that rose up and overthrew uh, overthrew the the king and the the French you know colonizers uh, you know in Iraq the the king was toppled in, a, in an uprising and that many of these despots that were imposed by the Sykes Picot Agreement were toppled in popular uprisings but some of them are still holding on Qatar is still that royal family Kuwait is still the royal family that was imposed on them Jordan now of course these are Muslim countries so Israel is widely hated. However, um, these are still the monarchies that were set up by the West and imposed on these countries. So Jordan, on the one hand, is very friendly to the United States. I believe it hosts U.S. military personnel and U.S. troops. But on the other hand, Jordan, the king of Jordan, condemns Israel and speaks loudly against Israel because it's a Muslim country and that's popular opinion. And there's a lot of Palestinians living in Jordan who have fled, right? There's a lot of them that, that you know, have yeah. relocated there. So, so they have this balancing act where on the one hand, they are so against Israel, they're opposed to everything Israel does. On the other hand, they really want to get along with the United States, which is Israel's biggest ally and supporter. And so they're playing this balancing act. And I, I think at the end of the day, Jordan will pick the United States. But when they do, that will be a moment where it will be very, very hard for a lot of the people in the Muslim world to respect them. Uh, because at this point, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah. how can they claim to stand with the Palestinians when they're not only not doing anything to support the Palestinians as the bombardment is going on? They're on top of that, helping protect Israel from an Iranian attack. At that point, you know, how are they how are they really on the Palestinian side? They're not. Yeah. Uh, let's bring in Shanda for a second, see if she's got any questions or anything to add to the whole conversation. Uh, Shanda Masta is here. She's the co-host for today. I don't know if you know her. Shanda Masta, Caleb. Yeah, Caleb Shanda Oregon, Masta. We yeah. Shanda, have... you got any questions for or statements for Caleb and anything you can address? I, I love Caleb's analysis of this. He is dead on. A, you know, I, I think that the biggest thing we saw from this is that um, Iran can poke holes in the Iron Dump. They proved that, right? And they can use up a lot of fucking tax dollar money in um you know anti missiles and all of that but it also exposed jordan for their kind of sellout co-opted king that they have uh, talking out both sides of his face right and i think the muslim communities in jordan saw that and um i do expect him to continue to support um, uh you know what the us and israel want but no caleb i think you do an amazing job and you know i'm a big fan of your work so keep it up because you're informing so many people even us in the trailer park let let's stay on what she's talking about over here what shannon massa just alluded to is something that i've been thinking about it too as well because i understand the situation a little bit too as well if jordan continues and this is this is like an historic moment right this is an ethnic cleansing going on in gaza 35 thousand people dead mostly civilian and women is there a possibility if jordan still plays the u.s israeli card that there could be some type of uprising with so many palestinians in jordan your thoughts on that me i i mean 
It's possible, um, but I feel like the Palestinians have been in Jordan for quite some time. The Jordanian officials know how to control them to some degree or other. But then again, uh, things in the Middle East right now are in flux because the strategy that Obama employed was very much playing Shia Muslims uh, that are friendly to Iran against Sunni Muslims that are friendly to Saudi Arabia or Qatar and Turkey. Among Sunni Muslims, you have two major trends. You have Wahhabis. Those are the very conservative, you know, Sunni Muslims that want like a, you know, like a government like Saudi Arabia where women can't drive cars and things like that. That's Wahhabis. And then you have what what they call westernized Muslims or, or people that are followers of the tradition that comes out of the Muslim Brotherhood. Turkey and Qatar are like that. And they will say things like America is more Muslim than the Muslim world. That They, they believe in the free market. They believe in, uh, you know, certain tenets of like Western values that they see in Islam. Right. And that's the Muslim Brotherhood current. That's they're, they're both Sunnis, but they're very different in their perspective. One is kind of embracing the Western world and Western capitalism. The other is like trying to go back to the Middle Ages and feudalism. But they both don't like Shia Muslims. Right. And Shia Muslims, that's the tradition of Iran. That's the Hezbollah. That's the Houthis. Um, and Obama very much tried to play up the idea that there was what they called a Shia crescent, that Iran was trying to take over the Middle East, was trying to create an empire. And they were trying to create a Shia crescent. And during the Arab Spring, uh, Muslims that are Sunni were mobilized from all over the Muslim world to go to Syria to fight against the Syrian government under the guise that Syria was working with Iran to create this Shia crescent, right? Yeah. These um, are the moderate rebels, right? right? Yeah, right. And that this was very much Obama's strategy, was let's play Sunnis against Shias. Let's utilize the Muslim Brotherhood in particular, uh, but Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, let's utilize them to kind of whip up the Muslims of the world against Iran, against Syria, and against the, um, the, the wing of the Islamic world that is sympathetic to Iran. Um, and... The result of that uh, was, you know, all kinds of people in Syria becoming refugees. Uh, it was, you know, it was a disaster. Um, and you, it continued under Trump. Donald Trump, you know, he went to Saudi Arabia and he said his goal was to create an Arab NATO against Iran. And he also was pushing the Abraham Accords, which was yeah. trying to get countries that are sympathetic yeah, to Saudi Arabia to recognize and establish relations with Israel on the basis of, OK, we all hate Iran. Right. That was the idea. And that was the strategy to polarize the Muslim world between Shia and Sunni. And it has completely failed uh, because right now the whole Muslim world's united against Israel. Uh, and, you know, Muslims, whether they're Sunni, Shia, Westernized, Wahhabi, they hate what Israel's doing. So at this point, the Muslim world is completely united. Obama has failed. The other thing, though, and that this is really important, is that with the Iran nuclear deal, uh, they were very much trying to manipulate Iran's politics internally. In Iran, you've got two factions, right? You've got the reformist movement, the people who don't like them call them the moderates. And then you've got the hardliners or the, the people who like them, they call them the principalists, right? And there are some people in Iran that want to get away from the anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist anti tradition of the Islamic revolution and become more of a, a free market and Western country. And there's some people that say, we need to get back to that. We need to have some more Islamic socialist kind of system. We need to be more socially conservative and we need to re reaffirm the principles of the Islamic revolution. And with the Iran nuclear deal, what Obama was trying to do was strengthen the reformist movement. He wanted to help Rouhani. Rouhani was the president. And Rouhani was saying, Ahmadinejad, my predecessor, he's an extremist. He's a radical. And our economy is suffering because he talks against Israel too much. He talks against capitalism and he's offended the whole world. So I'm going to get in there and I'm going to make a deal with America. And that's going to make things better for Iran. And that was the reformist movement. And a lot of younger people in Iran. The majority of people in Iran are under the age of 35, I believe, right? Most of the people in the country were born in the aftermath of the revolution. The young people went out in big numbers and voted for Rouhani because they were looking at Facebook and Twitter and, and social media. And they thought that, uh, you know, that America was a great place and that they could have the free market and all of that. And so they voted for Rouhani and Rouhani got into office and he signed the Iran nuclear deal. And he said that the economy of Iran is going to get better and that this hardline radical approach that's been isolating our country. But I'm going to play nice guy with America. I'm going to make this deal. It's going to make the economy better. Well, what happened? They made the nuclear deal. 
And for uh, a couple months, the economy got better. And then the U.S. government put more sanctions on Iran. Yeah. Then Donald Trump got elected and he ripped up the nuclear deal. deal. Yeah. And then they murdered the hero of the country, Qasem Soleimani, who is like the most famous person. He's like the superstar of Iran, right? He, you know, people say he's like the combination of like some great military hero, George Washington, combined with like, you know, the most famous, uh, you know, you know, with, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Taylor Swift or something, right? It's like, it's like the, he's a media celebrity and a military patriotic hero, right? And when he was killed in cold blood, Right. Um, I mean, it was it was they in invited him to negotiate in Iraq. He went to the negotiation meeting on his way to the airport. He's in a car and they droned his car and killed him. Uh, I mean, it's just a cowardly thing to do. I mean, it wasn't some epic, you know, the way Trump supporters were cheering for it online was sickening because it wasn't a wasn't a heroic thing. He basically shot a guy in the back. You know, yeah. it was a, a cowardly assassination. Um yeah. But at that but point, because really quickly, Caleb, yeah. and I don't mean to interrupt, you know, but it's also because they're so ignorant to what's going on. They don't even realize that this guy was one of the reasons why ISIS had had the retreat at one point. In fact, they thought he was a part of ISIS. Please continue. Yeah. Yeah, no one had killed more ISIS fighters than this guy, Qasem Soleimani. I mean, so Qasem Soleimani got killed. And at that point, Iran is like, OK, we listened to the reformist movement. Uh, and what did we get? We got our economy wrecked. Uh, and then we got our top national hero killed. And so now the current president of Iran, which I interviewed at the United Nations, we had a sit down interview for RT, which is banned from YouTube, by the way. You can see it on my Rumble. YouTube banned our interview for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but I sat down with the current president of Iran, Ibrahim Riazi. He's a hardliner. And those young people, they either stayed home or some of them even voted for the hardliners. And the, the people in Iran that are sticking to the Islamic revolution, that are against American imperialism and American capitalism, that want to trade with Russia and China and don't want to trade with America, they're going to be in office for a really long time now. And what Obama was hoping to do, it was the strategy kind of like the fall of the Soviet Union. They saw Rouhani and the reformists, they saw them as kind of Iranian Gorbachevs. Right. They were going to get the moderates in there and then they'd have some of their young people go out and protest and they'd gradually be able to bring down the Islamic revolution by maneuvering inside of its internal politics. But it looks to me like Netanyahu and uh, a lot of the people in the Pentagon are so determined to make money off of having Iran as the boogeyman. They couldn't go along with this soft power manipulation strategy to try and destabilize Iran and meddle in its politics. And so because Netanyahu needs to be popular and he needs to have Iran there to scare everybody and because, uh, you know, a lot of different reasons, uh, the USA couldn't really carry out this soft power strategy and manipulate Iran's politics. The hardliners are going to be in power for quite some time now because the reformists have been completely discredited. Everything they promised has been completely didn't happen. The opposite happened. They, they led the country to great humiliation. Uh, so that's really important to understand as well. This is this yeah. situation where Iran attacked Israel, this is a huge defeat for Barack Hussein Obama. This yeah. is a complete failure. Everything that he hung his hat on as president has completely come down. I, I can't wait to go check out that interview with Raizi. And the Raizi uh, election was one of the smallest turnouts in Iran in a general election in a long time. Like you said, they stayed home. They stayed home yeah. for that election. Uh, Let's take up this another article really quickly. This is by antiwar.com. Something I wanted to pay attention to right here right now. We understand what America will do. Uh, Israel will do. They're, you know, uh, they're together at the hip, right? They're, they're joined at the hip over here. They, they almost have the same behavior when it comes to not caring about civilians. Or in a situation like this, you see the Ukrainians hitting some, uh, you know, possibly trying to hit some uh, nuclear power plants. The IAEA worries Israel could strike Iran's civilian nuclear program. Um, there's a lot of fingerprints on that Moscow massacre that went on from not just the Ukrainians, but the United States as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, these these people are madmen. They don't give a damn. What are your thoughts when you see something like this or you hear something like this, that something like this, where they can hit a nuclear power plant, which would be devastating. When you hear stuff like this, uh, Caleb, what do you have to say about it? Well, first of all, it has to be pointed out, and you cannot point this out enough because U.S. media just lies about this all the time. Iran has signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They are not allowed to acquire nuclear weapons. And under that treaty, every nuclear power plant in Iran has to be monitored 24-7 by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And there's cameras and there's people there. So 
Their nuclear power plants are monitored and closely regulated. And at no point has the International Atomic Energy Agency ever found Iran to be in violation of the treaty. They have never violated the treaty or tried to acquire nuclear weapons. If they did, we would know about it because every site is monitored. And then you'll remember that, and they've been playing up this idea, Iran's trying to get a nuclear bomb, which you know they clearly are not doing, which violates their laws. If you go back to the Islamic Revolution, Khomeini actually used the slogan, neither East nor West, because he didn't want them to be al aligned with any country that has nuclear weapons. They say that nuclear weapons violate Islam. Um, they, they've never been trying to get a nuclear bomb. Um, However, they played up the idea that Iran is trying to get a nuclear bomb. So the nuclear deal that was signed, you'll remember, that Iran nuclear deal involved Iran basically giving up almost all of its peaceful nuclear energy plants. So almost all the Iranian nuclear power plants were gotten rid of. There's barely any of them left. So the, the idea that Israel would then go around and attack like the two nuclear sites they still have, which are monitored 24-7 and say, oh, that's because we thought they were getting a bomb. I mean, that's just ridiculous, right? I mean, there is no Iranian nuclear program. They've never violated the treaty. They, I mean, I mean, that whole thing is just, is just a bunch of malarkey. Um, but Israel, you'll notice, it really doesn't like nuclear energy. Israel murdered a French citizen in 1981 when Iraq had a peaceful nuclear energy program. They had a, a nuclear power plant and they were contracted with the French government to set it up and they had the IAEA monitoring it. Out of the blue, Israel declared that they had the right to go bomb the peaceful nuclear energy facility. And they killed a number of Iranian scientists and they also killed a French citizen because they said, well, you know, Iraq, we don't like them. They're against Israel, so they can't have peaceful nuclear energy. Meanwhile, the whole world knows that Israel has a huge stockpile of nuclear weapons. I mean, WikiLeaks has shown this. You have Jean-Claude Wanunu. And so Israel thinks they have the right to have hundreds of nuclear bombs and lie about it to the world and not sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but no country in that region has the right to even have a peaceful nuclear power plant without them threatening to blow it up, without them murdering citizens of, of those countries, as well as citizens of Western countries to stop it. This is a, a level of entitlement that is just absolutely absurd. All right, let's let's uh, let's get on to the last section over here. We, you know, uh, you've been with us for almost an hour, of course, well, about 40 minutes, but we, we like to use it as much as we can. Uh, let's get on to uh, let's finish this off with uh, Russia, Ukraine, and specifically when it comes to the <laughs> Speaker of the House. Did you see this over here? I mean, this is something that uh, that Shanda mentioned earlier in the show. I don't know if you ever seen The Godfather, but, you know, uh, Sonny, who is uh, Michael Colleone's older brother, and he was supposed to be the leader of uh, the Colleone family, but eventually got whacked and got set up. But he was really upset that Tom was not a wartime consigliere. But we don't have to worry about that, but Speaker Johnson, because Johnson calls himself a wartime speaker and will push aid, uh, Ukraine aid, despite the opposition. This is one of the things he said he was not going to do. We thought when we were getting Speaker Johnson, we had two things uh, solidified. Number one, we have a, a, a speaker who's going to be at least for somewhat freedom of speech, right? That he's not going to censor so much or push for more censorship. We certainly didn't think that the FISA court... Uh, the Pfizer court warrant uh, bill would be signed, and now it's even juiced up with more power for the security state. And we certainly thought that at the end of the day, the Ukraine money would go away. Uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson called himself a wartime speaker on Tuesday as he defended himself after Representative uh, Thomas Massey called for his resignation over a plan to hold separate votes on military aid for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. We need steady leadership. We need steady hands on the wheel, Johnson said at a press conference. Look, I regard myself as a wartime speaker. Massey said he would back Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene's plan to file a motion to vacate, which would trigger a vote to oust Johnson as speaker. If every Democrat votes against Johnson, only two Republican votes would be needed to oust him. Uh, I, I think for sure at the end of the day, uh, Caleb, we're going to see Israel always get their money. They're going to find a way to get Israel their money no matter what. Israel's our daddy, right? So we're going to get to their money. Taiwan, I think with the Republican hold uh, uh, Congress right now in the House, and even still, I don't want to put it on the just the uh, just the Republicans. The Democrats haven't been that you know kind to, to China as well. Nancy Pelosi was the first to take her jet over to Taiwan when that stuff stirred up a couple of years ago. 
what are your thoughts with Speaker Johnson trying to push for more Ukraine, uh, Ukraine funding? And also, you've been covering this a lot. I heard that the Russians are now starting to expand the front line further, uh, further uh, west. What's going on? Uh, do you think they're going to get this money, number one? Number two, what's it like on the battlefield over there? What are you hearing? Well, in, in regards to the what's going on in Congress today, um, if you look at so they, they they introduced into the House of Representatives, they got three separate bills now, Taiwan, Ukraine, Israel. And the Ukraine bill is particularly hilarious because these Republicans are saying, why are we spending all this money on Ukraine? So Mike Johnson has come out with, well, we're going to give them sixty one billion dollars, but they have to pay it back. Right. That's 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 the new stipulation. Yeah, geez. They have to pay it back. That's the new uh, hook. Yeah. And and a third of it doesn't go to them. It goes to military contractors for the weapons. And then we give them the weapons. Right. So that's that's why it's supposedly OK. But the crazy thing is, if you look at the details of the bill, they have to pay it back. Uh, but the terms of them paying it back are negotiated by the American president and up to 50 percent of it can be forgiven. So this completely gives America complete leverage over Ukraine. I mean, any notion that Ukraine is a sovereign country, that we're fighting for their independence. This is not an independent country. This money comes with strings attached. And we see now with the mobilization law that just happened. I mean, they're dragging every old man out of his bed and putting a uniform on him and making him fight. They're, I mean, they're kidnapping people off the street. Nobody, nobody in Ukraine wants to fight. I mean, it's, it's over. And Russia has then said, and now you're asking me about the front, Russia has said, I cover the UN, Russia has said numerous times, this war, we won already, right? We got what we wanted. We wanted to disarm Iran or Ukraine. We wanted to disarm Ukraine. And at this point, Ukraine's, all of their regular military is destroyed. They only have what the Western countries are giving them. Uh, and on top of that, we wanted to liberate our people in the, in the Eastern regions who have had their democratic rights violated since the 2014 coup, right? They've not been able to speak their own language and they've been bombed and droned and such. And, and 16,000 of them died. And finally, Russia said, all right, we're moving in to protect them. Well, they've already protected those people. Uh, and, and the Ukrainian regular army is completely destroyed. So Russia says, we won this war already. Can we just sign a treaty and be done with this? Like it's over. But the NATO countries are determined to keep this war going. And now the talking point that Biden is going with that that we're hearing from the French leaders and others is that Putin is going to going to take over Europe. Yeah. Where are they getting this from? You know, I mean, I, I don't know where they're getting this from. But, you know, it's like it's like it's like that that, that, that Putin wants to make Paris part of Russia or something. This is ridiculous. Um, but that's the only that's their excuse for keeping the war going. Russia doesn't want to keep the war going. It's over at this point. And the Ukrainians can't even find more people to drag to, to go and die for this. It's so cynical. And I got you got to, you know, the real outrage here at the end of the day, so many lives lost. But you got to think about how much pilfering of this money has gone on. Do you know? I mean, they have revealed and Seymour Hirsch has done great journalism. Zelensky's inner circle, the generals and the top cronies at the top there, they all have fancy apartments in New York City. They've all got yachts and all of that. And every time we give Ukraine another billion dollars, they scrape millions off the top and they are going to come out of this war in which thousands of their own people got killed. Uh, they are going to come out of this to retire as as m billionaires many times over. You want to talk about cynical. They don't love Ukraine. You wouldn't do that if you loved your country. Um, this is a really cynical scam. I mean, this is a money laundering operation more than anything. And oh, yes. how much is enough? I mean, how much more money do they need? <laughs> I mean, they're going to walk away from this. Do you remember, you know, they got like half, half of the country was convinced, you know, they had to send money to Ukraine and donate to Ukraine. And the Ukraine flags were everywhere when this first right. started. They yeah. have, they have robbed, they have grifted. You want to talk about grifters. Zelensky is the biggest grifter on the planet. Yeah. And they just, they haven't got enough for some reason. I mean, this just, I mean, how much more do these people want? Okay, so here's my final question before I get you out of here, right? So we we heard right now this whole kind of demented narrative that, it, you know, Putin's going to take the, you know, he wants to recreate the old Soviet Union, right? Paris is going to be part of Moscow, right? Yeah, this is be ridiculous. part of Russia, yeah. which sounds kind of cool, right? No, not at all. <laughs> you know, listen, you were one of the first to get out there in the streets and have rallies for the people in Donbass when nobody even knew how to spell Donbass, couldn't find it on a map. Right. It took them almost eight years before they got involved. A lot of people in Moscow were upset that Putin dragged his feet. Even Yanukovych was telling him, hey, man, 
as he's fleeing because of the, the Orange Revolution or the coup, whatever which one it is, I, I lose track of these here, the takeover, right, where Ukraine... Euromaidan, re- yeah. Yeah, the Euromaidan, right, when they really lost their sovereignty and it became a puppet state of the United uh, the United States. You know, Joe Biden gave the thumbs up and had a boy uh, to Victoria Newland, Jeffrey Pyatt handing out cookies on the Maidan, yeah. uh, you know, Senator Murphy along with, uh, what's his name, uh, McCain, and Lindsey Graham whipping up the Azov mm-hmm. Battalion, having speeches with them. You know, this is this has been going on for quite some time. I want to tip my hat off to Oliver Stone for making Ukraine on fire because it's a good movie yes. for people to understand exactly yes. what's going on. And by the way, less than 10 days, my movie, uh, Lahaina on Fire Volume 2, is coming out 100 days nice. after the nice. thing. But that's just a little side note. I digress. All this is going on. I don't think that Putin ever, or the Russian Federation, I should say, ever wanted to take Donbass. I don't think they wanted to manage it. They went through Minsk 1, Minsk 2. They were trying to get a deal for whatever reason, right? You can say it's because the Russian Federation wanted there to be a Russian contingency within Ukraine, so therefore they would have balanced politicians and it wouldn't be so uh, pro-EU. Whatever the case may be, he didn't want to manage those territories because when you take them on, you got to manage them now. And I think the old Soviet Union learned that it's a lot to manage when you have all these territories to manage. And they already got eight time zones, I think, in Russia. There's already a large uh, landmass. They don't need the extra to land. With that being said, we know it's BS that he's not going to expand the, the old Soviet Union into Europe. However, has Kiev given them any choice but to take it at this point? Can he sit back? You know, I mean, he's trying to create a buffer zone. We hear that. We understand that. The Donbass, now part of the Russian Federation. But it seems like they're not stopping. They're getting all this funding from the United States. It almost seems, Caleb, that the Russian Federation is going to have no choice but to take Kiev. Your final thoughts as we get you out of here. I think that that Russia very much wants this war to end. It's taken a toll on the Russian population. It's taken a toll on the country. It hasn't economically destroyed them like they're, you know, like the West is trying to say is the case. But I don't think Russia has any desire to make, you know, Kiev part of part of Russia, part of the Russian Federation. But if there is not a negotiation, I mean, what will they be forced to do? I, I mean, and that's the tragic thing about this. I think Russia held off intervening in Donbass. They held off doing that for eight years. Um, and there were a lot of people in Russia, in the Communist Party and in other political parties that really wanted Russia to move in in 2014. Uh, but the Russian government held off and it did everything to avoid it. Uh, and, you know, I guess if if, you know, Ukraine is determined to lose it all in this conflict, um, you know, if anything, that would be more of a cost to Russia. Uh, it, it, you know, I mean, I feel like the Western leaders might want that because then they could use that to demonize Russia, say that it was their plan all along. Uh, Russia would have to maintain it. As you said, that would be a big cost. And that that may be what Western leaders are trying to, to set up to happen. Um, it kind of reminds you of the plans for Taiwan that were revealed, right? So Taiwan has got computer chip technology and it was revealed, it was leaked that not only, uh, does the United States, uh, you know, intend to provoke China to retake the Island of Taiwan, but the United States has plans that when China retakes Taiwan, uh, America will go to Taiwan and bomb the computer chip factories at the same time, just to make sure the Chinese don't get it. Now, is that your friend? Right. If somebody does that to you, imagine someone's your friend and they, they they tried to get you into a fight with someone who's 10 times as big as you. And then their plan when that fight happens is while that fight happens, they go to your house and break all your stuff. Is that your friend? Right. Because that's I mean, that's that's what the United States. I mean, if, if the USA cares about Ukraine, why would you provoke Ukraine to get into a fight with a country that's way bigger than them? Right. Uh, I mean, this is this is at, at the end of the day. These countries are being very, very cynically used in the same way Afghanistan was used in the 1980s against the Soviet Union, uh, you know, and that's where Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda and all of them came from. This is very, very cynical on the part of our leaders. Uh, They love to manipulate people. They love to kind of take advantage of, of people's ethnic and regional differences, because, I mean, look, there are differences, right? Ukrainians and Russians, yes, they they have a very common history, but there are there is tension there. There's differences, right? I mean, you know, the, the government on Taiwan and the government on the Chinese mainland, they don't see eye to eye, obviously. There was a big civil war, you know, and the USA loves to take advantage of these differences. And rather than helping people, you know, who may have disagreed, you know, you know, see eye to eye and trade and benefit with each other. Uh, They cynically take advantage of these differences and they take sides in these regional confrontations. 
and they they escalate them and they end up using these countries as proxies. And the narrative on CNN is we just care so much about the Ukrainians. We just care so much about the people on Taiwan. We just care so much about the Uyghurs. We just care so much. But they don't really care about them. They're using them. They're using them in geopolitical intrigue. And it's these folks who end up paying the cost with their lives. Amen, brother. You said it perfectly there. Shannon, if you got anything else uh, for Caleb, because listen, really quickly before you, if you do, I don't know, Caleb, this is a quagmire. I don't know how that the Russian Federation can go on knowing that they're still going to have this Nazi Azov battalion banderites, uh, you know, at their border, this, this Zelensky government that's controlled by the United States. You know, they were having NATO uh, facilities already built there before. You know, I mean, I believe the last president before Zelensky, uh, bragged about it right blackwater had been in there training troops for quite some times they were killing these people in the donbass these civilians with american weapons so i don't know how he could allow them to exist i don't know if they try to pull a color revolution the way the united states did with kiev but it it, it definitely is a quagmire in my mind shanda please anything else for caleb um, I don't think I have anything on Russia front, but I do want to bring it back to the United States. And Caleb, get your take on these uh, grassroots uh, protests that we've seen pop up all over the United States and shut down airports and piss off, you know, blue collar workers all over who couldn't get to work or get to, you know, their flight this week. Uh, are they effective? Who is it helping? Um, you know, are they truly grassroots? Well, look, I want to be sensitive and realize that many people that are allies of the Palestinians say that anyone who can do anything to raise awareness about their case, that helps. Right. right. And and so they're going to see it that way. But as somebody who's who's step steps back, I'm seeing the big picture to average Americans who are trying to get to work one day. And then a bunch of people with Palestine flags are blocking their car and they're stuck on the Golden Gate Bridge for hours while a bunch of people with Palestine flags are there blocking their car. Uh, that helps Israel because Israel says, look, the people with the Palestine flags hate us and it looks like they hate you, too. And uh, see, we have a common enemy. I mean, they blocked the Holland Tunnel in New York City. Uh, a very similar situation. It it doesn't help. And I think that when it gets down to it, the problem is that a lot of the left, uh, they don't they don't see average Americans as who they're fighting for. Right. They, they kind of have forgotten the whole Marxist thing about the working class, et cetera. They, they want to demonstrate their virtue, virtue signal, yeah. right? And they want to show that they're the good Americans, that this is a racist, evil country, and they're the good ones, the moral ones. And so they see targeting average Americans and making average Americans' lives more difficult as somehow productive because, because those folks are the bad people. They're not part of our woke cult. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and it's a really, really dangerous. And I think it helps Israel at the end of the day, um, you know, and that, that, you know, the question is, are you trying to build a mass movement that includes the bulk of the American population? Or are you trying to build an isolated group of people who think that they're right and that they're superior? Um, and I think that's that's really the problem. Um, and that at the end of the day, I feel like and I mean, forgive me. And there are probably Palestinian folks watching that are that don't agree with this and they have the right not to. Who am I to tell you what to do? But I feel like if the Palestine movement had just as many American flags as they had Palestine flags at their rally, and they stuck to the message of $18 million a day for Israel, while our schools are shit and our roads are crumbling and we don't have high speed railway and we don't have health care and Israel gives its population free health care and we don't give it to our population and we're paying their bills. If we stuck to that message, if it was kind of an America first message, of like, why are we funding Israel when our own country is falling apart? I feel like the Palestine movement would be 10 times bigger and would probably attract way more support. Uh, it would be much harder uh, for many of the Republicans, especially who try to make the case that we just have to support Israel. If they were confronted with that, uh, rather than America is a racist, white, evil settler country, just like Israel, you all are bad people, whatever, right? If they were confronted more with an America first argument, it would be more effective. That's my opinion. As someone right. who's looking at this, not as part of like the leftist bubble, but as looking at the whole yeah. population. And yeah, to we, be clear, we yeah. are very much pro-Palestinian here. And of course we support protesting, but do it the right way. Get in front of the people that it matters, like your elected representative. Don Kirby. And Let's APEC. Go to Kirby's and house State and Department. Don't let that and, son and, of a yeah, bitch out, there's right? There's plenty of ways you can make uh, an impact and um, be seen and be heard without uh, inconveniencing uh, everyday Americans 
and turning those against uh, they did an amazing job of turning people against them on on monday or whatever day it was is what i, I i'm sorry to interrupt there shand i got excited you're absolutely right what you just said because i was like you know what what caleb's on to something here right he, you right. know american flags with palestinian flags right that's something unique over here right like, I, I didn't even think about that but yes you're right if they said listen we're all oppressed over here. We might be getting bombed and this might be crazy, but we're all left in the gutter. Let's go occupy John Kirby's house. Yes. Let's not let that son of a beeswax leave his, his house. You know, let's have a hundred thousand people out in front of these people's houses. Let's go. Let's that's where we got to go. We don't got to go and stop people. I, you know, this is a, a tactic I, I was against when some of the black lives matter folks, you know, they went onto the freeway and, you know, it just like people, you know, and there are people like, you know, there's a guy, I got to check in the work. I'm on probation here. I'm going to lose rights to see my son if I don't get to work. And we're yeah. sitting here and we're holding him up. And, you know, people got to pay, you know, money. They got jobs to, to to hold and feed their family. And we're stopping them to get into work and all these things. It's, it's not effective. It actually pits people against each other. So you're right, Caleb. We got to be smart about this. I say, let's go to John Kirby's house and don't let that son of a bitch leave. Let's go to Mitch McConnell's house and Lindsey Graham's house and don't let that son of a bitch leave. Same thing with Nancy Pelosi. Hakeem Jeffries, Hakeem, stay in your house, buddy, because you're not allowed to go anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, Caleb Maupin bringing it to us live here on Pasta to Go. Thank you so much, Caleb Maupin. Good luck. You want to make an announcement about CPI or anything that's going on, brother? Could you hear me? Did he lock up? I think he might have locked up. No, that's just his face. He's looking. Wait. <laughs> wake up. Wake up. Kayla, wake up. <laughs> Kayla. Kayla, wake up. Can you hear us, Caleb? Uh, Give it a second. He should glitch back in. Should, but that, yeah, that was pretty divisive in the chat, that question. He's, and he's yeah, frozen. it's tough because we do protest. But uh, God, I just see the hate swinging back around on that one. Dude, if it, it was, listen, if that was in the chat, that was a little divisive. Why don't we get some comments up? Because we're going to end the show there right now. I know we had another section, but I'm on a tight schedule. And I'm not, we're not going to be able to get to it. That's fine. Uh, tomorrow, Whatever I'm going to show do. back. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the Puff Daddy stuff. I did want to talk to you about that. But, uh, man, I don't know what you're doing tomorrow. Let me know. Code Pink and many are doing uh, that they outside uh, Nancy Pelosi and Blinken's house. No, but, yeah, not all the protests, right? Right. Just some of them. Code some Pink them. is a small group. And they do some great Funded work. Funded by the CCP, you know. according to the Republicans. <laughs> well, I mean... Listen, I, there's a lot of things I don't agree with the Code Pink, you know. Right, uh, me too. But yeah. I know they're not funded by Russia, like Nancy Pelosi and some of these asses yeah. are saying. China, right? right? China, like, China. We got to continue to do that. We got to continue to go to these people's houses. We got to show up at their offices. All that. No, let's not stop the everyday average person from getting to work. I'm sorry, I get it. I understand what people were saying that you make them so mad that they got to realize what's going on. But you know, you're actually being counterproductive of what you need to be doing. How are the protesters supposed to protest? Then not only uh, that, we ignore the police in New York City with anti-terrorism training are going after these protests. It's, it, it's terrible. It's awful. Um, I'm not ignoring it. I think it's something that we need to bring to the forefront. Great point, Chris H. Um, you and I yeah. have been in many, many protests. You've been arrested. You know, I've been pepper sprayed and batoned over the years. We've been surveillanced. We've been stingrayed. We, we've had it all rolled out on us. And we screamed at the top of our lungs for the last eight years. You guys, it's coming. You guys, they have it. You guys, it's getting worse. There's Caleb. Yay, you made it back. Yeah, Caleb. my internet went out. I don't know what happened. It it's okay. Kind of we want to give you a proper goodbye. So if you can do us a favor and give us a proper goodbye, let us know. <laughs> let us know what you got going on. Okay, sure. Well, um, you know, uh, the Center for Political Innovation, we, we're doing a lot of important stuff. Uh, I've got some new books out. Uh, I published a book about the Houthis. Uh, who are the Houthis and what are they fighting for? It was the top book uh, in the category of Yemen uh, for a few weeks on Amazon back in January. It's gotten quite a few positive reviews, both here and around the world. Uh, so check that out. Who are the Houthis? What are they fighting for? Uh, you know, the Center for Political Innovation is always marching ahead. You can check out our website, cpiusa.org. Uh, we've got an exciting summer coming up. We're planning protests at both the Democrat and Republican conventions, as well as at the NATO summit in D.C. So we, we got some some exciting activism ahead of us. So it's going to be a great time. Thanks for having me on. 
uh, Pasta, you do great work. It was really great uh, meeting Trailer Park Pundit as well. Uh, you know, when when she came to our conference in Oregon, uh, she got to meet all our CPI folks, and yeah. that was really really great. And yeah. and so yeah, thanks for all the great work. I was that you supposed do. to be at that event, but I was having some serious eczema stuff. But now, just so you know, so you can be happy, my eczema is under control. Supplements. Very good. Well, you made a great video that we showed. Yeah. That was tremendous. So thank you. And uh, you know, I continue to do my reporting for RT. I was just in Russia for a while. Now I'm back and I, I keep keep fighting the good fight. That's all we can do, right? Yeah, I mean, you do some great work letting people know who the Houthis were. Like I said, I remember the first one of the first uh, rallies that you got out there for the people in the Donbass. Like a lot of people didn't even know what was going on. But, you know, you were out there and you were fired up and you were angry. And, you know, like, you know that was like, you know, eight years before the uh, the intervention for the Russian intervention. And uh Wow. I mean, uh, here we are today. Look at what's going on. Uh, we're we're so close to World War Three. It's scary, Caleb. So keep, uh, you know, educating the people and spreading that knowledge and writing those books. We do appreciate you coming on, buddy. Sure thing. Talk to you soon. You got it, Caleb. Caleb Moppin, everybody, ladies and gentlemen.